Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And we, we really hope you enjoyed the film as much as we did. Um, so welcome to Heswell's virtual community event for World Environment Day. I'm Nick Drew of Planet Heswell, and I'm hosting this evening's panel, helped by Ed from Rethink Now. Well, tonight saw the launch of 2040 in the United States. And out of respect for George Floyd, George Floyd and in solidarity, um, Damon, who we've been watching the film, decided that he was going to postpone his American Q&A session um, because, in his words, there can be no climate justice without social justice. However, we're going to continue, but we're going to have an awareness for, for what is happening over there. No one is too small to make a difference. And individual action is really important. Now, linked to the film that we've just watched, there are resources to help you think about what you might want to do and to help you create a tailored personal plan. You can get to those from the What's Your 2040 website. We'll stick a link to that in the chat box. But this community screening has been about more than just individual action. We want to start a community conversation about the future of Heswell. We won't come up with all the answers this evening, and the answers need to come from the whole community, not just those, those few of us who are here this evening in the Q&A. And I firmly believe that it's only by having a shared vision of how we want Hesel to look in 2040 that will make the right long-term decision for all those people who will be living in Hesel in 20 years' time. And we'd like you to be part of that positive creative conversation about our shared future as the community of Heswell. We have set up a Facebook group, Heswell 2040, to carry on the conversations after this. And we suggest you use that hashtag, Heswell 2040, in any social media posts you want to make. Now, we're expecting there's going to be more questions than we'll have time to answer this evening. But we think it's really important to start to uncover some of those questions to help shape our way forward through these strange and difficult times that we're facing for our community. In a moment, the panel members will introduce themselves. We'll then start with some reflections on the film. And you can type in your own feedback and questions in the chat window, and you can use the heart emoji to show you like or agree with someone else's comments. We ask that you make contributions in a positive and constructive spirit and stay on topic about Heswell in 2040. And we're aiming to wrap up at about 9 p.m as we're conscious that we're, you know, we're aiming this at a family audience, we don't want it to go on too late. And we'd also really like to hear from our younger audience members. So you know, this film is about their future and we want them to take part in this too. So you've heard enough from me. Um, can I invite the panel members to introduce themselves briefly, please? Catherine, can you start us off? Yes, uh, thank you, Nick. So, um, yes, I'm, I was actually born and grew up in Heswell and I currently live in Heswell. Um, I'm a teacher and lecturer in nutrition and I also have um, an interest and a passion um, for permaculture, uh, which is a set of design principles for sustainable living and also food growing as well as part and parcel of that. Um, my name is um, Sam Peddy and I own the, um, well, uh, the barn in Heswell, which is a creative craft venue. Um, we've been going about two years up until the pandemic. Um, and um, I have a keen interest in uh, the local community and um, the eco-friendly side of things. So we are uh, promoters of being a plastic-free venue um, and hopefully encourage our visitors to adopt a similar ethos to us. So my name is Naomi Graham and I live in Heswell. I have a son at St. Peter's School in Heswell. I'm a member of the St. Peter's Church congregation and have led them to um, gain the Bronze Eco Church Board. I'm also a trustee of Dale Farm, um, which is just on the outskirts of Heswell. And I work with Wirral Environmental Network. So that's an organisation that supports <coughs> groups across the Wirral. Hi, I'm Liz Gray and I'm Cabinet Member on Wirral Council for Environment and Climate Change, including Transport Strategy. Um, and I'm also, a, I'm also a teacher and a climate change teacher. 
and I'm a mum and I live down, just down the road from Hurstville, a short bike ride away. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Nikki Bolton. I'm the deputy head at Hesel Primary School. Um, we're an eco school, so many of the things that we've seen this evening resonate with what we do in our own school. We've been very fortunate to win Eco School of the Year, for some of our work this year, and also Better Schools Energy Award. Um, and you might have seen some of our children, I've put my t-shirt on today, wearing our Ocean Blue campaign um, to uh, we've asked to encourage local people to take the plastic pledge. We run a large scale event called Science Into the Stars every year to promote um, environmental and scientific activity in the local area. Thank you, right. Thank you everybody on the panel. Um, so what I wanted to start with was really just some, some initial reflections about what you thought of the film and if there are any aspects that you felt were particularly inspiring or you had a strong connection with. So just start again and go around with, with Catherine please and I think. Uh, thank you yes I mean I found it actually a very inspiring film and you know as far as the climate change narratives concerned you know I really like that it was moving away from this you know the kind of the apocalyptic narrative um, the fear-based stuff that maybe you know we can only take so much of um, towards a real vision for the future, you know, and it was a real positive message, a really positive narr a narrative for the future, you know, and actually showing how, giving almost like a roadmap of how we can get there. Um, and I love that the theme, you know, the themes were all about regeneration um, and tangible things that we can actually do to show that we ourselves really have the power to make this happen. Um, and for me personally, you know, I just love the stuff on regenerative agriculture, um, you know, it being all about carbon sequestering as, as a, you know, it's moving away from rather than just this idea of organic versus non-organic farming, it's actually a way of producing food that's healthy for the planet and saves the planet at the same time, um, improving the soil, um, and actually it's economically viable simultaneously. So yeah, I, I I love seeing that. Yeah, I mean, I'll endorse what Catherine said about the positive message in the film, which I think it was refreshing. Um, the project seemed very doable. Um, and I think from a business perspective in Heswell, um, and I know that Nick's passionate about joining businesses together and we're all here to try and have a united front with a community project, hopefully. So I was encouraged by the fact that a lot of the messages and the suggestions were, were I feel, were potentially very doable as a collective. Um, I particularly um, liked um, the, the greener locations, you know, if we, the facts about the grain, 80% um, we can actually, um, of the um, food we can manufacture ourselves, 20% seems to be what they were saying was the big agricultural to feed the animals for us to eat the meat. And I think these facts that were imparted were really quite shocking. It's, some of them weren't um, known to me. So I think if we could get together on a project, um, even the solar, um, that um, example that they gave, was it in um, Bangladesh? I can't remember the country that they were discussing where they were each um, home had a solar panel and they then lent energy. I thought that was fascinating. Um, I don't know how achievable it is on our scale, but it's certainly something I would like to start a discussion about. It was fascinating. Naomi? Yeah, I think for me, um, it was that solutions exist and that they're out there and um, that many of them that we saw in and were community based. Um, I had a particular strong connection with the greening, like yourself, Sam, um, and that cities can be green and that so our, um, our streets can be green, our streets can be low traffic. And then, you know, it was lovely to see people on the streets um, and people interacting with, with, with the greenery around them and with each other. So that was particularly. And then in terms of a, 
a pet solution that I like. It, it, it's the mini agroforestry. So, you know, the fact that when you're planting trees, you can also be growing fruit. And if you do this in little patches and small scales, that's got great benefit, not just for the community, but also for carbon sequestration. And if you think about the whole food um, cycle. So there's lots of things there. Um, I'll wait to hear from other people. Uh, I really liked it. I thought it was a really moving film. Um, I've seen it before and it, it, it's even more moving for the second time. I, I like the fact that it, it mirrors the um, United Nations climate training that I've done quite considerably. Uh, same themes of, of gender and children and food and transport. Um, and the same idea that small communities making a difference. Um, and also the same sort of almost sense of shame that it's some of the people who are leading the way in fighting climate change are actually in developing countries. And so we've really got no excuse in one of the richest nations on earth. We should, we should really be leading the way and helping everyone else not following their, their lead. Um, but it's the same sort of thing in, in, the, in the UN climate um, training that actually um, small groups of people can make a disproportionate amount of difference when they really want to. And I, I particularly like the transport. Like Naomi, I like the vision of, of streets with people walking and cycling and enjoying the space. That's fantastic. And I really like the natural regeneration as well. That's, that's a, a really important thing we have to do. I, I particularly like the way they, they use the children's voice to guide through the whole process. And they kept referring back to the children and asking them what they thought about it and what their ideas were for the future. And obviously they are the future. They are the ones that we need to inspire. Um, and it, it was very clear, we follow the global goals at school, uh, the UN goals, um, which have just been mentioned. And then, um, you know, the idea of empowering children to believe that they can make a difference. Um, it was important to have those children, I think, threaded throughout the whole, the whole film. Um, I like the idea of the boards as well in, in the schools. Um, and I, I can understand how that would work and, and allow the children to understand the local environment, because we've noticed ourselves and work that we do, if you, if you don't, um, give children understanding about what things look like locally and that, that they can make a difference locally then they're never going to understand the impact they can make lo uh, globally as well. Um, I think it would be something I'd quite like to show the parents in our school as well to, you know perhaps hold it um, show it again in, in an evening when we're allowed to um, end social distancing I think it would be a, a lovely thing to invite them to come in and, and see and um, to inspire the, the wider community of parents as well but I found it fascinating our school our school motto is small actions make big differences and that was how they ended the film so I thought it was brilliant. Great thank you. Um, we, we're starting to get some questions into the chat and in fact we've had some for a bit but I just wanted to get your initial reaction so um, because I'm, I'm the one who's able to see the questions at the moment I will um, raise a couple for you. Um, so just to give you a, a bit of a flavour, um, there's questions about cycle lanes and agro-industry. Um, and, and I think there's, there's something here which, which really resonates with me, which is around um, what is the sort of the strategic plan here um, from a Heswell perspective. Um, would anybody like to have a, a, a go at trying to um it's a big question Nick. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the thing um I'll, I'll start and then i'll let everybody else chip in I, I think the first thing is is actually building the community so you can get the community ideas because that, i think we probably all have our own thoughts and and potential options but the main thing is actually bringing the community together to understand what they want and what's important for them um, I think the learning about, you know, what the issue is and what our own individual impact and our community impact effectively is would be a good starting point. And then I think we can start identifying and understanding what some of those best solutions are together. Um, anyone else? I'd love to say to pedestrianise Heswell, um, but I think we need a realistic goal. <laughs> I know that um, the, the, the cars are a major issue for a lot of people, um, but we just can't 
I don't think come up with a project as big as that. So starting small and inspiring um, the community to get involved in a small scale project and building on it, I think would be great. Even just imparting a message. I mean, it's been quite inspiring just spreading the message about this film and seeing the support for it. So it's certainly there at a local level. I can't wait to get the shop back open so I can start imparting it mouth to mouth because you can have a much greater impact as I do when I chat to the customers face to face. So if we can get together as a community and, and meet, that would be that would be great. I'm, I'm raring to go on, on a project. Can I answer what Sam's just said, follow on from what Sam's just said? In terms of the local shops and businesses in Heswell, um, in terms of strategy, um, we, we get told repeatedly from in various areas when we try to talk about pedestrianising, uh, trying to take over road space for bikes or pedestrians, we get told it's, it's shop owners and businesses that don't want that. They want the parking spaces and they want the roads um, and they're the ones that traditionally um, launch the backlash against any moves to pedestrianise. So if you could get some more local businesses to become as enlightened as you, um, <laughs> spread the word and ask you know, cooperate with anybody in the council who's trying to pedestrianise and trying to uh, improve uh, active travel and, and walking, then that would be absolutely wonderful because that's one of the main stumbling blocks is the idea that it's local businesses like you that actually want all the cars to come in and, you know, want all the parking spaces and vehicles. So if you can prove that you don't and all the other um, businesses join you, then you'll, you'll get your dream. <laughs> I'd love that. We have a car park behind the barn and um, I've mentioned it many times. I'd love that to be car free. I'd, I'd like to have gazebos down by the, you know, from the post office to the Johnny Pie. I think that's a far nicer environment to wander around. It's obviously creating another space perhaps for the cars, but, you know, obviously the vision would be amazing to have those electric cars. And I've just watched that film with my mum and my brother who both said, wouldn't it be great to have that is our um, future. These cars that would just pick us up and drive us round. They don't have an attachment to the materialistic side. We're not driving Porsches and no longer own a car. So I, it would absolutely be a joy for me to be able to jump in one of those electric cars. So if I can get more businesses on board with the idea and, and do something positive in that direction, then I definitely would be for it. It's good for businesses. Oh, sorry to come in again. So I'll, I'll shut up in a minute. But it's there's loads of data to show how much um, more people spend when they're walking and cycling compared with when they're travelling by car. So it, there's a lot of data out there to back up the argument that we actually need fewer cars. Businesses benefit when we have fewer cars. I'll it now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to move on to another question. This is a, a question from Ingrid, who's asked. Is anything being done to educate people in small communities to start with, to generate and to be responsible for electricity? She thought that was incredible, apart from the film that we saw. So I, I think that thing about how we educate people in small communities to be responsible for their resources, and I, I think that would be um, interesting to talk at from a sort of school and, and church and business perspective. So, um, Nikki, would you like to talk a bit about, about how you've been doing that in the school yeah yeah so um i think i mentioned earlier on we do an event every year called science into the stars which is a platform that we use to educate not just our children but our local community we have over a thousand people that come along um, and we invite along as many local um environmental organizations and scientific organizations um as we can this year we had over uh, I think 66 organisations all together and a number of those were people who um, advocated different kinds of um, well things like solar power um, we had the local authority came in and talked about wind power there were m many different um, solutions now it's quite difficult at the moment <coughs> um, to encourage companies to come to that event but it's something i'm looking at for the future because i think you know if we could encourage more people to come and give local community members solutions and ways that they could um create energy themselves at home that would be amazing from a children's perspective we do work with a, a lot of um, power companies that come into school and talk to the children about um different types of energy solutions um, we had Scottish Power in this year and they made different generators with children and talked to them about renewable power. Spent a lot of time talking to them about tidal power as well, which was quite interesting. 
um, and was something that you know even I as a teacher didn't really understand properly but I do now they demonstrated how it worked to the children and and for me it's about inspiring them um, because they are going to be the next generation of engineers and people who come up with these solutions um, and it's quite interesting when you see them in lessons like that thinking gosh I could actually do this myself in the future um, and I'm hoping that maybe one child I've taught one day or our school at Heswell Primary have taught you know maybe they will be somebody who comes up with an amazing energy solution and um, so from an education perspective we, we just try and give them as many different opportunities as we can to to, to meet engineers and meet people who are creating these things and 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 hopefully we're going to inspire the children to be to be the you know the next generation that, that create these solutions that we need okay so um got a question from from steve anderson and, and i think this is a, a particularly poignant one it's, um the bit that he found missing from the film was how i as an individual could catalyze a change so what what thoughts have of the panel got around how we can make change happen in Heswell? Can I say a few things? Yes, please do. If, if, if you lived in Heswell, then you support local businesses um, and, and try to stay local and uh, walk and cycle wherever possible. Uh, you could reduce your meat consumption and you can also take part in volunteer groups as well. So you could litter pick in, in that area. Um, and you can, you know, we've got a campaign, we're trying to reduce glyphosate spraying across the council. Um, one way that people can help us to do that is to take part, maybe cooperating with the council um, as volunteers to, to, to weed, even if it's just there outside their house. If everybody did that, you know, we'd be chemical free overnight. So there's lots of things, loads of things that people can do, um, whether it's, in their garden, rewilding a bit of their garden or composting, you know, there's absolutely, <coughs> that's just a few things. I'm sure everyone else has got loads of things to add. It's a really good question, that. I think people do tend to feel overwhelmed at how they can play their part. I, I constantly get asked um, the, that they feel told that the issue is so big, they're so overwhelmed that they do nothing, so they take no action at all. So um, I know I've sourced um, some products for people and I say just change something simple from a, a plastic um, level like your dishwashing brush. And um, we've now got the, um, the wooden sustainable um, biodegradable brushes, um, which they just change the head on. Um, so they use a compostable cloth. It's just make one small change and make one small change every month. Um, and then you'll soon find that throughout the course of the year you've made 12 changes that you never thought you could adopt as a day-to-day -day practice um, and that's just on a, a small scale um, but you know small changes equal larger ones down the road. Yeah. Our, our children have found litter a particular problem um, when when we take them out and walks around Teswell that the first thing the children say is gosh look at all the litter um, so I think that would be a, a huge thing if people just pick the litter up. It's, it's come, come, uh, outside the school, it's consistently something that we notice. Um, the other thing that our children have, have suggested, because we quite often ask them for solutions, is a lot of, because we've had a big plastic pledge campaign recently, a lot of them realised that they were buying milk from Sainsbury's and plastic containers. And now we invited the local milkman to come along and now a lot of the children in our school have changed over to using glass milk bottles and that was a, a very small thing but now that there's an awful lot of our children doing that and really enjoying getting the milk in the morning from the doorstep but you know a huge impact and a huge change in the amount of plastics they're using so we were really excited that that happened in the last sort of six months. Yeah and I was going to say as well you know it's, it's like with this recent very hot weather that we've had um, you know it I mean, I think in Heswell, there's, there's a lot of garden space that people have. Um, and of course, the drought, drought that we've had has badly affected people's lawns. Um, and I think it calls almost for a rethink of how we might use that space even. So first of all, are we, you know, are we capturing perhaps as much rain as we could? So rain, rainwater storage, um, you know, in an individual house. Um, but also then how are we using that land to grow food, you know, and in the film, you know, there were these examples of, you know, 
uh, regenerative agriculture practices, um, you know, maybe growing more perennial crops, crops that are suited or plants that are suited to um, changes in climate. Um, and within the community itself, you know, we can maybe instigate um, seed sharing schemes and things like that, just on a very uh, local level and sharing knowledge and skills around that, because I think it's a huge resource um, in Heswell itself. I'd, I'd just like to, to follow up on that with a, a sort of a question from from Clive, which is to follow on to some of that. So agro industry has great clout and lobbying influence. How do we even begin to counter their message? And I think with with obviously we're all having so much agricultural land around. I think it's a, an interesting question to ask. Anybody like to have a stab at that one? Local production, I think, is the way forward with that. Um, you know, create, creating our own uh, food sources within Heswell, you know, maybe maybe 20 years time, we could have some, you know, community supported agriculture scheme uh, where people are going in and being part and parcel of, of the food grain process. Maybe we can, you know, relinquish some of the car parking space when we have all these driverless cars um, to these kind of innovations where we're producing ourselves um, healthy food. I think I, I would add to that and it goes back to the shop locally and actually it's shop thoughtfully. So um, when you're buying food products, try to consider where they're coming from and how they're being grown. And there are lots of wonderful options across the Wirral that actually if we shopped from rural sources, we would be supporting our own local um, agricultural industry and, and local jobs. I mean, there are some farms that are desperate to sell locally, but are finding that they're having to, to ship vast distances and they shouldn't need to have to do that. We're here and, and we should, should support them. Right, I'm, I'm gonna move on to another question. And this one's from, um, from Nicholas Jones. Um, how much do we think self-driving vehicles will change transport use? Can I answer that? Yes. Okay, hold it. Um, I'm really quite worried now that we've been set back um, with transport. Some of our plans that we were making have had to change drastically because of COVID. So where you might want to, we were really pushing people to use public transport and clearly we've been told now don't use public transport unless you really have to so that this is a really big question that we've all got to address as a community as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a planet because that was the big push and can it still be the big push um, so clearly people are taking to their bikes and people are walking more and in terms of driverless cars that that was being talked about i mean i spoke to george about driverless vehicles and he was really keen on it and I, we can't really think of it in the same way post COVID because clearly you don't want to be sharing a, a vehicle unless it's been deep cleaned between everybody. So that's, that's got to be a really big thing that we think about. And I think we're, we're going to have to redo public transport. Um, that's a big question, but we can't all get back into our cars. We just can't do it. So we've got, we've got some questions coming in about things like, um, rewilding and whether we could have a wildflower grass verge at roadsides outside our own homes and we've, we've had a bit of rewilding during the lockdown and, and now you know we've obviously started mowing again but um, are there issues where we could increase some of the the wild areas around around our communities That's yes definitely i mean this is, this is one of my big pet things um They've, they've started mowing because they're concerned about the machinery um, getting snagged on long grass. Um, so I, I, I suggested that they get into using scythes, but I don't think that's gone down very well. Um, I think that we need to get used to a different idea of aesthetics and we need to get used to a different idea of what grass verges are for. And you know, maybe if we cut them twice a year rather than every so many weeks, um, it, we'd, we'd all benefit, nature would benefit. All the little things that were nesting and, and um, going through their life cycles. I don't want to see them all mowed at the wrong time of year. So I'm really pleased that I'm getting lots and lots of feedback about how lovely the verges look and how people are noticing not just the wildflowers, but all the different types of grasses as well. Um, and I think, that, I think that's great. And that, that is something that's actually been very positive. 
So if we can all sort of spread the word and, and that actually nature is not messy, it's beautiful, um, and just get used to this new aesthetic, I think, I think we'll, we'll benefit from it tremendously. I think that's the message that seems to have come from the lockdown, isn't it? That everyone's enjoying their gardens, the birds, the wildlife, things, noises that they've not heard in ever, perhaps. And so hopefully we can try and make them realise that that's what we want more of, not less of, and try and avoid going back to the old habits um, of a throwaway society. We, we don't need it, do we? So having a trophy garden that looks pristine and a centimetre tall is no longer the garden you should have. You should have one that's looking partly dead with wildflowers <laughs> growing out of it, weeds wherever they want to, to, to be and bees everywhere. To, uh, to have the ecosystem that we should have, not the one that we, we visually uh, perceive is the one that we should have. A nice green garden is no longer a trophy garden. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's some great research, I think, on rewilding showing that actually it really massively improves um, carbon capture you know, if you can rewild areas, um, including, you know, rewilding of, you know, I know down south they've actually rewilded some farms themselves and brought in wild animals and, and that's really enhanced biodiversity and they've managed to get a yield um, from actually soil that was previously, um, you know, not, not very productive at all and not um, economically viable. Right. Um, I think we've got we've got time to certainly have one or two more questions, but I'd, I'd really like to hear if there are any any younger people um, who would be watching the film, if, if they wanted to put in some questions into the chat box, either personally or, or, or get a, somebody else to do it on their behalf. That would be really, really useful because we, we do want to make sure that we've got a real sort of intergenerational thing going on with this with this conversation. It, it, it felt to me that a clear message from the film was around the young people and the world that they'll inhabit. So if, if there are any questions out there um, coming in from, from younger watchers of the film, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, just while people are thinking about that, um, th there's been some questions about what what will happen next with um, with this, um, I'm conscious that there are there are more questions that have come in that we'll we'll probably have time to to deal with in in this session. Um, I will um, tidy up the the questions that are in the chat and put them onto a onto the Facebook group that we set up as a sort of a starting point for some of these discussions and hopefully the conversation can carry on with with other people chipping in as well as we go forward. Nick, can I just, um, I watched this with my son and uh, there was one moment in the film when they were talking about the fact that fish were caught in Iceland and shipped to China and then processed in China and shipped back to Iceland and the, the daughter was saying, what were you thinking? And my son thought that was very funny <laughs> and was <laughs> turned around and said, yes, mum. What were you thinking? <laughs> I, I don't know if there are any kids out there watching at the moment um, or who had been watching the film, but I'd, I'd really like perhaps afterwards if they or their parents can get in touch via you and give us some of the ideas so that we can start answering that and um, start thinking of some new things. Nikki, you're probably best placed to, to talk about <coughs> what the kids might ask. Well, they, you, you ask, I mean, they, they'll be full of questions. I mean, I don't know how many children have, have been watching this evening. It might be a, a good film, certainly to show our older year sixes. They would definitely enjoy watching that and thinking about it. Um, the, the children are amazing, really, because they come up with solutions that you'd never think of yourself. I mean, you, you saw that in the video. They were, they were talking about rocket boots and all sorts of things like that. And, you know... I kind of hope that they'll come up with solutions that we haven't thought of ourselves in the future because they, they are, they watch things like this in a different way than we do. They, they can see different possibilities. Um, que question wise, I know they'd be fascinated. I, well, I was fascinated by the, the concept of the seaweed in the, in the ocean because I never really thought about the, 
many uses that had and and that'll be something I'll certainly teach about in school now when I go back or it'll be something I'd, I've talked to them before about different types of ways of creating energy and we have a twin school over in Uganda and, and we've worked on some projects with them already uh, looking at solar power and different ways of creating energy but certainly the, the seaweed I'd never thought about and and that it's those kinds of things that really inspire children and make them start to think of different solutions so I couldn't tell you the actual questions they would ask because they probably wouldn't ask anything I would think of it would be something completely off the wall um, but maybe I'll show them and then I'll list the questions for you that they ask and then you can see what I mean They'll, they won't be what you expect that's all I can say. <laughs> can I just add something because I teach secondary and um, most years I teach a lesson for a series of lessons where we talk about how my family hurts the planet and how my family helps the planet um, and it's it's the answers that get me that they it's more than their questions they're amazing answers every single year for for decades i've i've learned something new that i should be doing from just sharing the conversation so the, the families come back to me with this is what we're doing you know we, we run water when we're cleaning our teeth and all these things that they do that they know they shouldn't be doing but that's the list of answers every year there's something new and every year i think crumbs i need to start doing that or i need to stop doing that and it's, it's they, they've actually got loads of answers they're amazing yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got one time for one last question, I think, um, from Roseanne, um, which is what environmental measurements can we make at a local level? Can you be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's 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 something about how we measure our progress, isn't there, um, on this journey that we're on. And I think um, understanding what, what measurements we can make locally and um, what things we're interested in. I like the idea of the dashboard. Sorry, Naomi. No, no, go on, Liz, and then I'll chip in. I, I, I really like the idea of the dashboard. In, inside the council, we have a sort of climate dashboard that we look at to see how we're getting on. You know, what are we doing? How, ma how many um, remote meetings? having how much fewer uh, car journeys are we making and that's that's within the council so we have this dashboard to reuse which is wonderful those dashboards are wonderful and things are great the climate dashboard is particularly useful if we could get something like that going for schools that would be fantastic i, I really agree with with, with Nicola that i think so that's, that's a very very useful tool for, for, for children um and if you if we could have our own sort of family dashboards you know what are we doing what have i done today what have should I be doing? You know, have I moved to renewable energy? Have I got myself, um, you know, uh, an electric vehicle or got rid of my car altogether? That's if we could have a dashboard for, for ourselves as well as a dashboard for our local community. Um, I, th I think the dashboard ways of looking at it is really graphic, really useful, and does foster change. It makes you think about what can I do to improve that dashboard. There you go. I um, just on that point, I um. There was an app I was introduced to, I can't remember the name of it, but I'll post it to the Facebook group. And it was simple things that I could reduce my carbon footprint by um, when I'm cooking, putting a lid on the pan. Um, and it reduced it by so much um, carbon emission and it actually told you what your scale was on this. I think it was a one to ten scale. So each time you did one small, tiny little change, it be putting the lid on your pan, brought that down. And I think those tiny little changes, as little as they are as a collective community, will, will have more of an impact. You know, I don't think it's just making that leap from converting your petrol car to a, an electric car, although I have seen it on building off grid. So I'd be interested to know how that can happen in practice. But just putting a lid on a pan can be a start when you're cooking your vegetables. So you can make very small kitchen changes <laughs> that can have a bigger impact. I think there's a couple of things that um, and they tie together. Um, WWF have a very good carbon footprint calculator. Um, so if you're interested in what your carbon footprint is um, at an individual level, you can um, go onto the WWF carbon footprint calculator. That will also show you the areas that you might actually want to focus on. Um, and it will show you where you are in comparison to the rest of the country um, and what the footprint is of the rest of the country. But when we're looking at pulling that together in a, a community carbon calculator, there's a couple out there. Um, we haven't decided which is the one that we want to use yet. 
but um, we'll be posting about it and we can actually put up some options for communities. But um, as an individual one, I would, I would recommend the WWF, World Wildlife Fund one. Thanks, yeah, that's a great one. And I've done that as well. And it's very interesting because you get to see, you know, that actually, you know, as a car user, that, that can actually be a massive um, part of my, you know, carbon budget and how that compares to somebody, um, you know, on the other side of the world that has a tiny footprint. And it really makes you think, what can I do that? car sharing schemes maybe if it's a long journey getting the train this sort of thing so yeah some great tools out there great thank you Catherine so I'm just going to, to ask us to just briefly wrap up now so if, if you could just give me a, a sort of a, a final thought that you've taken away from this evening um, that would be um, very helpful thank you so Catherine would you like to kick us off with anything well, yes, I mean, it, it's really great to have this conversation, you know, with everyone. And, and you know, I think it, this does feel like very much the start of conversation. And there's, there's so much more that we can explore in all of these different areas. And I think if we can extrapolate some of the ideas from the film to Hesworth, <coughs> you know, it's about really visioning and imagining a different Heswell in 20 years time doesn't have that isn't littered with cars but does have you know a lot more people walking and cycling everywhere um that's cleaner that has a you know fantastic nature around it um and clean energy systems you know and lots of local food growth so yeah you know it's it's, it's how we get there that's the next step isn't it? yeah i agree with catherine we started a conversation and i think we feel inspired by having watched the film and I think we all think it's very doable. So hopefully we can seize on that positive message that we witnessed in the film and take it forward. And as a Heswell business, I'm keen, as Liz has suggested, in speaking to other businesses and hopefully bringing them on board. Um, and I genuinely believe that I have a responsibility as a business um, and obviously have a voice. So I'm, I'm raring to go, I'm willing to use my voice. I'm, I'm heartened by the interest and um, the desire that's out there to, to make a, a greener, lower carbon as well. And, you know, the prospect of it being a low traffic, green environment that's filled with people um, and a low carbon business community is exciting. So um, I'd love to be part of the next step of the conversation. I also, I'm just really pleased that the conversation's happening and it's really important to people become obsessed with it and just bring it into every conversation you have about anything with anybody, uh, including and especially with children, and, and also reach out to them. Because I know that you're connected with the other communities. It's not just about um, what we bring into our homes, it's about sleeping outside as well, it's about how we travel, and it is. Don't go vegan and then go to India. You know, think about how you go on holiday. Maybe go on holiday locally as well. You know, really, really celebrate the local area. And, um, and yeah, again, the World Wildlife Fund, the, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature uh, carbon footprint is absolutely amazing. Use that and get competitive with yourself <laughs> all the time. It's really addictive, isn't it? Get competitive with yourself. Get competitive with other people and just keep it. Yeah, I, I think um, including the children as part of this journey is absolutely vital because the more ownership they have and the more inclusion they have in, in any projects that, that, it, that we go forward with, um, the more likely they are to carry those forward. Um, I, I, know, I know what a powerful influence they have on each other and on, particularly on their parents, to be honest. The children can be as responsible for changing their parents' um, actions, environmental actions, as any kind of social media or anything, if you've got a child saying to you, you need to be recycling this, you need to be doing that. And a lot of our parents come and complain after we've done projects and say, oh, you wouldn't believe the amount of recycling I've had to do. And, and I think that's brilliant because it means they have got a voice and they can make a difference. And, and really they're our future, aren't they? They're, they're the ones that we need to convince to, to make these changes as well as the adults. So, you know, I hope that we can be very much a part of this process alongside. There are, there are many schools on Wirral 
um, we're part of a much bigger project, C2C, and I know that all of those schools are all working together at the moment to make a difference. Um, we started with the Plastic Pledge last year. Um, we've got lots of plans to do many, many different things in the future. So, um, yeah, I think ch children are the, are the way forward. So infl influencing children and encouraging them to support anything that we do as a community is really important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you to everybody. I'm, I've had a really enjoyable um, discussion, this Q&A panel. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to thank each of you as, as our panellists and, and all the people who submitted questions. And I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, but as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll post them onto this Facebook group that we've set up so that people can carry on with this conversation, understand a little bit more about some of the, the, the thoughts that people were having during this. I'd also really like to thank Ed for all the technical support that he's, he's given us on this and Matt as well with the social media um, and of course Angela who, who um, helped to create this event really and brought it into being. So um, thank you to everybody um, who's helped both in the run-up to this and this evening and it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.